exceeded 2,700. However, we did reach a grim milestone because we now have more than 10,000 cases statewide, 10,297 to be exact. Uh, sadly, we also had an increase of 60 deaths. The total number of deaths statewide is now 370. What we're seeing today, we think, is going to look more like the daily normal uh, going forward, um, although we do know that there are still uh, certain uh, test results that are lagging behind. Um, but the 13 percent increase in cases today um, is, is a much more uh, that that increase uh, is much more in line with what we expect to see day to day, not the 42 percent. Uh, that we saw yesterday and that's that's really what I'm trying to communicate to you but the rate of spread the number of cases uh, will always depend upon uh, the degree to which our people are complying with the stay-at-home order with all of the social distancing uh, guidelines that we're putting out and minimizing social contact we knew and have been telling people for a long time that getting through this crisis would resemble a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so I'm again asking people to be patient, to stay in their homes, uh, and take the stay at home uh, order seriously. Uh, your neighbor's life depends on it, and quite frankly, so might your own. Another bit of good news is that with 53,645 tests to date, Louisiana is second in the nation per capita. This is important because it does help us to see what's out there um, and gives us a better idea of how to uh, respond and, and prepare for the future. There are uh, interesting new tools and dashboards that are popping up. Uh, that are trying to capture whether folks are actually social distancing or not. Uh, like Google, uh, which just came out with its community mobility reports. Um, and what its report shows is that Louisiana uh, and our people started to take this seriously around the time of the end of March, which is when I announced an emergency declaration. You can see this is, uh, goes back to March the 29th, and you can see the, the graph there. Um, and so we know then to the degree to which this activity reduced uh, that the mitigation measures were working and that the spread of the disease was actually slowed. It would be, um, that there would be more cases in Louisiana today had we not done that, done that and that's very clear. Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, the, there's other social distancing uh, dashboard by Unicast out there, uh, which is based on aggregated cell phone data uh, that shows that there are still a lot of Louisianans who are not uh, taking this seriously, not complying. And perhaps it is because for some reason uh, we have not, I have not uh, impressed upon all of our citizens the consequences, the dire consequences of not staying at home. And you can see there's some bright spots out there because Orleans Parish gets an A, which is incredibly important because that is one of the biggest hotspots in the country. Uh, but you see that Jefferson Parish gets a B, so they're doing relatively well uh, in Bossier also. But you think there's large parts of the state that are not doing well, and, and I'm encouraging everyone uh, to take stock of this. As we mentioned before, this is a statewide problem with respect to the novel coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease. I think it is now in all but 60, I'm sorry, all but three of our parishes uh, by test results, but it is in all of our parishes in actuality. Um, so this is a statewide problem. We need everyone paying more attention uh, to the stay at home order and being more compliant. You know, modeling is something that we've talked a lot about, um, and it's been talked about at the national level. And I know um, a couple of nights ago, or maybe three nights ago now, that from the White House they did a press briefing where they put up um, some modeling, um, several different models, as, as I recall. Um, but it's essential that we use modeling to determine how we can best respond to COVID, but also to illustrate to the people 
how they should best be responding to this, and that is through those mitigation measures that we've been talking about. It helps us to know what we can expect to need in terms of beds and ventilators, um, and when we might expect that we're gonna exceed our capacity in certain regions to deliver life-saving health care. So today we're gonna go through a chart with you to help you better understand how the mitigation measures, the social distancing, the social distancing measures, the stay-at-home order, are impacting our communities uh, by slowing the rate of spread. Uh, spread. And we're gonna specifically focus on region one, which is the New Orleans area, because that is where we have the greatest data to analyze. That means the modeling is more mature. Um, and certainly we are working to develop the same information for all the regions of our state, but this is the one that we have today that we wanted to go uh, through with you. This modeling is a collaborative effort between the Department of Health, LSU, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Oxner Health, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana. As I mentioned, the two data points that we get every day that are most reliable and tell us uh, with the most precision where we are uh, on these curves um, is the number of individuals hospitalized with COVID-19 and those individuals who died from the disease. These are the numbers that tell us how much COVID is in our state uh, and, and do that to a better degree than the actual number of positive cases because we know that there are a number of individuals out there who are going to be COVID-19 positive, but they're not gonna be symptomatic and they, they're not gonna go get a test, although they can continue to, to spread the disease. So we have indications, um, quite frankly, that are giving us some hope, uh, a glimmer of hope. It's, a, it's still early. Um, but we do know that, that uh, the amount of compliance that we're getting it is not enough in order to have the best possible outcome. Uh, so to those of you out there who are complying, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate, and the overwhelming majority of the state of Louisiana sincerely appreciates what you're doing. You really are helping. Uh, but for those of you who are not taking the crisis seriously, um, I'm asking you to do a better job. Again, the life that you save could be your own. As I've said before, we're not going to enforce our way out of the crisis. It's going to take everyone doing their part by staying apart from others to help us flatten the curve and slow the spread. The death rate in Louisiana is higher than anywhere else in the country. But we are getting much closer to the norm because what we're finding out is we actually have much more COVID in our state than we previously thought. And so the death rate isn't uh, from COVID isn't that much out of the ordinary. But we do have a higher death rate, and I suspect at the end of this, uh, we're going to still have a higher death rate than most places because we have underlying health problems in a larger proportion of our population, including, including those chronic health conditions that make people especially vulnerable to this disease uh, and make them more prone to succumbing to it, uh, such as kidney disease, heart disease, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, those sorts of things. Now, Dr. Biu, uh, who's been with us uh, every day as Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public Health, he's gonna go through the chart and explain in more detail what that uh, chart is telling us here and what it should be telling each of the citizens of our state. Yesterday, in addition to extending the stay-at-home order until April the 30th, I also signed a proclamation to ensure that high school seniors and current post-secondary students are able to meet the requirements to be eligible for TOPS or to be uh, eligible for the continuation of TOPS, whichever the case may be. Among the things that this order does is extend the qualifying ACT score deadline to September the 30th. Also, on an important note, for small businesses that need relief, and there are many of them out there, uh, as a result of this crisis, if you haven't already, you should immediately apply for SBA loans if you're interested in doing so. Time really is of the essence um, because there's a finite amount that was appropriated by Congress and signed into law a week ago today. Uh, although it's a large amount, 
$350 billion, it is finite. And I think as you see more businesses around the country apply uh, for these loans, that amount is going to dwindle down. And so we're encouraging people uh, to go to SBA.gov, go to SBA.gov and fill out an application for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, this is a loan designed to provide direct incentives for small businesses to keep their workers on payroll. And the SBA will forgive the loan. And this is really important because it's a loan at first, but it can be forgiven. If employees are kept on the payroll for eight weeks and the money is used for payroll, rent, mortgage interest, or utilities. So to find out more, please go to sba.gov. I'd also like to remind everyone that yesterday we launched a text alert system that will provide timely COVID-19 updates and other critical guidance directly through the governor's office. To sign up, if you want more of this information, please text LA COVID to 67283. LA COVID to 67283. Already more than 100,000 people across the state have signed up for alerts. Additional information and resources are available at coronavirus.la.gov, coronavirus.la.gov. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. B to come up and, and explain more about uh, the chart that was up there with, with the modeling, because I know that some of you have been uh, wanting to, to hear uh, more information about our modeling. Thank you, Governor. Um, so as the, as the governor said, uh, almost since the, the uh, earliest cases in the state, um, we've been working at the department and with uh, partners uh, both in the academic side and health systems and health insurers uh, to build a model that would really let us understand what we should expect and how to predict what COVID-19 would mean for the state, especially when it comes to our most uh, important health care resources that we know would need to be there for those most severely affected by COVID-19, and that's hospital beds and ventilators. And you've been hearing us talk a lot about those. Um, you also, as the governor noted, uh, recently heard from the national um, uh, leadership in the, in the White House uh, about a model that they released. Uh, this model was focused on um, looking at the number of cases uh, across the nation on a daily basis and using, uh, essentially fitting that to a mathematical equation to see see how things are changing over time. Uh, so in the model that we're sharing here, uh, this is slightly different from that because this is a model that's based on the actual dynamics of the way the infection works. This is uh, really the standard way that we in public health look at an epidemic. Um, it essentially models out uh, a population that's susceptible to infection and then looks at as that, model, as that population changes and becomes infected, we see these numbers start to rise. Uh, and then uh, eventually it reaches a peak where there's nobody else uh, to be infected um, uh, easily. Uh, and those people are then removed from the model, either because, as most people are with this illness, they recover and they are better, uh, or unfortunately, as 370 Louisianans have, they die and are no longer able to be infected. And that's why you see uh, the, the, the model um, come down or the lines come down. So essentially what this uh, image depicts uh, are a variety of scenarios for the state depending on how we react to COVID-19 to stop the spread of the virus. Importantly, because we don't have a vaccine and because we don't have treatments that we know can uh, stop COVID-19, our only weapon that we really have is social distancing and staying at home, not coming into contact with somebody with COVID-19. We know from uh, now uh, international, national data and state data that on average, if an individual has COVID-19, they're at risk of transmitting that to anywhere between two and three people, uh, uh, other people who can then go on to infect two uh, to three other people. Uh, and so left unchecked, that leads to a really rapid rise in cases. And if we look at this graph, uh, the thin red line there that says baseline depicts that scenario, where anybody um, uh, who has the virus is really not um, uh, doing much uh, beyond potentially staying home if they're severely ill uh, to stop the spread of the virus. And what you can see uh, uh, on this graph is that we're plotting the daily hospitalizations, number of new hospitalizations on the vertical axis. And then we're showing you time starting in March with our first cases and going through uh, till March of the next year. So this is a year-long look. I mean, we look at that baseline. If we had done nothing, what we see is that by uh, about early May, uh, end of April, we would be in a situation, again, in Region 1. So these are the hospitals in, in St. Bernard, Plaquemines, Orleans, and Jefferson Parish, where they'd be seeing upwards of 3,700 to 3,800 uh, hospitalizations a day. 
These are not total hospitalized. These are people needing to be hospitalized every day. And the day before that, it was 3,600. So these numbers are, are staggering. Um, and then obviously at a certain point it would decrease. Uh, unfortunately, we know that the capacity in our region uh, would not be able to uh, uh, accept that. And so that's a situation where we have a lot of people showing up to the hospital, hospitals not having access to, to the needed therapies like ventilators that they need, and high levels uh, of people unfortunately passing away, higher than we're seeing. Um, so fortunately, though, we've, we've taken measures and, and through the governor's uh, orders uh, to change how likely it is that any one person with COVID is to infect somebody else. Again, it's incumbent on us to actually act on those orders, to not uh, um, uh, go out and, and uh, connect with other people or, or spread the virus. Um, but that's what's depicted here on the uh, other uh, graph. So I'm going to first take you to the blue line. And that right next to it says effective social distancing. So if you remember, shortly after um, we had our first uh, week of cases, um, we uh, put in, in force uh, uh, social distancing rules. So this means people were encouraged to stay home uh, when they were sick. They were encouraged to wash their hands, uh, cough and sneeze into your elbows, uh, and most importantly, stay six feet away from people um, and not have big gatherings. Initially, 250 people or less, and then we moved to 50 and now less than 10. So what that graph depicts is what happens to hospitalizations if we just did that. And what we can see is it not only decreases the peak, but it pushes it further away. So the peak moves now out to mid-May. And now, rather than 3,700 or 3,800 a day, what we're seeing is about 1,500 hospitalizations a day uh, in, the, in the New Orleans area, the, the Region 1 area. Again, that is a, a large number uh, to sustain. Um, fo uh, following that, a week later, uh, we had the strict shelter in place. And again, now what we've added on top of what I just described is a situation where all of you are hopefully staying home and not going out unless you're an essential worker, not going out unless you have an essential visit. And that doesn't mean every day. That means as needed going to get things like groceries, gas, going to the pharmacy. Um, and while you're out, taking these same common sense measures, staying six feet apart, not bunching up in lines, uh, gatherings down to less than 10. And importantly, for anybody who's sick or has symptoms, you're not leaving at all. You're asking somebody else to bring things to your house and you're really staying in place. In that scenario, what we see is even further pushing out the peak and really decreasing uh, the number of, of uh, new hospital admissions. There we see the peak is being pushed out really to early July. Um, and and at, the, at the peak point of admissions, we're seeing about 500 a day. Again, that is a large number of admissions for, uh, for the hospitals to sustain, but much different than seeing 37, 3,800. Um, so, so that's why we've been pushing so much for this policy, because it's really what's going to allow us to continue to push the day away to no vents, push the day away to no beds, and uh, allow the surge activities that the governor's uh, put in place to be able to absorb that extra uh, admission strain that we're seeing. So if I go back to um, the, the chart, the black bold line that says current midpoint is showing you where we currently project that we are. And this is because uh, COVID-19, we know people who have this infection uh, can be infectious for up to two weeks. And so we really have to give a two week period to see these policies uh, uh, actually have an impact on numbers. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're sort of tracking along as people have been doing the work uh, that you saw with the heat map of um, uh, staying at home, not going out and, and, and coming together. Um, and so there we are somewhere between that uh, really scary scenario with the red line and uh, the first scenario that we'd like to achieve, which is this blue line. Uh, we have indications that we continue to see movement in that direction, especially in those areas that correlate with that map, the areas that overlap um, with the map that the governor showed you, Orleans, Jefferson, East Baton Rouge, Bossier, we're seeing those. Those areas are, are really uh, showing the impacts of actually limiting their contact with others. And our hope is that as, if we can continue to do that and more importantly, spread that to the rest of the state so that everybody's taking this seriously, and taking measures in their own neighborhoods, we will see that line continue to get closer and closer to the purple line. We will push away the peak, we will decrease the number of daily hospital admissions and make it uh, more likely that we're actually able to, to have the surge um, uh, measures that the governor's put in place um, actually be able to absorb those extra admissions. And we're showing you hospitalizations here, but as the governor said, the, the things that we're tracking through this model are hospitalizations and deaths. And we want to avert deaths uh, most importantly uh, as well. And so with that, thank you, Governor. Thank you. So at this time, we will take your questions, and I'm assuming you're going to have a number of questions for Dr. B on, on the modeling. Yes, ma'am. So the way I'm reading that, um, 
we still we don't look very good. I guess is what I'm saying. The, where we are right now, we're not even close to the social distancing yet alone where we want to be in the strict shelter in place. It sounds like we're kind of not in a good place right now. Yeah, and I don't want to speak for the governor, but I think that's why you know you've heard every day that 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 he comes out to speak that this is still very concerning. This is still something that. We're here uh, at GOSEP every day looking at these numbers, talking about what measures can be taken. I agree with you. It's, it's not good, but there is a glimmer of hope in that we can actually act to change where that slope is. We can act to move this, uh, this graph further over um, away from us and down, and that's incumbent upon us, and only citizens, we as citizens, can do that. What does the midpoint projection mean that the peak would yeah. be? So, so I, I mentioned that at baseline we think that um, uh, one individual could infect between two and three, we'll say 2.4 people. That current midpoint is saying that one person right now with, those, with current measures is on average infecting about two other people. So we've, we've nudged, but we need to go much further than that. And that doesn't sound like a big difference to two and a half to two people, but when the growth is exponential, uh, those those small differences make a really big difference in the aggregate and over time, uh, because it isn't just uh, that an individual might might infect three; those those people could turn around and infect three each and so forth. But if you get it down to 2.4 to two to 1.7, the lower that is, the better off you are. Um, and and I guess the the thing that I've been trying to communicate um, consistently is that really even under our best case scenario, it is an extremely tough situation for our hospitals. Uh, and, and we do expect that at some point we're going to exceed our capacity as it relates to beds and it relates to ventilators. And understand, we're comparing beds to COVID patients. You still have non-COVID people who have to be in the hospital. Heart attack victims, stroke victims, motor vehicle accident folks, there's all sorts of folks who have to be in the hospital. And so, uh, and by the way, some of those people require ventilators too and intensive care uh, beds. And so, so this, is, this is really serious. Um, we're, we're doing this every way that we can to try to get the attention people to get more compliance so that we get the lowest transmission rate possible. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm gratified that, that it appears over the last several days, the talking points that we've been delivering here uh, have been echoed and reinforced by those coming out of Washington. So there, there is no daylight between what we're saying to you in the state of Louisiana and what's being said coming out of Washington, D.C. Yes, sir. Um, so going back to that strict shelter-in-place line, that's not you implementing stricter shelter-in-place rules. That's, that's residents strictly following them? That, that is if the people follow the order uh, strictly that is already in place. So yes. more so than they're doing Yeah, now. yeah. So, I mean, it, that, that tells, yes. I mean, and we can always have better compliance, even in places like New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Jefferson and Bossier, where it's better than elsewhere in the state. We know that it's not 100%. But so everybody can do better. But if, if we did adhere uh, in a real positive way to the current orders around sheltering in place, uh, keeping the schools closed and, and that sort of thing, we would be down along the purple line. Um, and, and so where we are uh, right now is somewhere between the worst case scenario and the best case scenario, but to the degree we get compliance, we start moving and keep moving and get closer to the best case and less people will die. That, it is really that simple because sometimes we can, we can kind of lose ourselves in the numbers and the graphs and, and so forth, but to the degree that people comply with the orders, then less people are going to die. It is, it is literally that simple. Jeff? Would that mean the strict shelter in place would be in effect all the way to September, October, based on what that graph is showing? Well, it, it would have to stay in place in order for that line to follow out uh, all the way. Uh, now, look, we don't know that we're ever going to get on that, on that graph, and so we don't know whether we stay on the purple line or on the blue line or somewhere in between them. And that's why we have to continue to monitor where we are, and we will make announcements about what the future looks like based on where we believe that we are. And, and, and by the way, the, the underlying assumption for at least one of the models shown uh, by the president the other day uh, had the mitigation measure staying in place for the month of May. And I know his current emphasis, and, and by the way, my order, too, it takes us through April the 30th. 
Uh, but in order to keep the deaths in the country between 100,000 and 240,000, which is what they were talking about, that assumes that the full mitigation measures stay in place through the month of May for the country. Just so you understand that. Yes, sir. As far as this modeling goes, how do you, in talking about the current midpoint projection, this, I assume, takes into account even when four Region 1 hospitals would be overwhelmed in, in early April? How does, like you mentioned yesterday, April 7th for beds, yeah. April 12th for beds. So this would just make that even even worse. Up to 2,500 hospitalizations a day, that's with everything already overcapacitated? All right. I'm not sure that I follow. He's shaking his head. I'm going to let Dr. Alex go. Yeah, this, this is actually a point that, yeah, so this is a point we've been trying to make as well when we're talking about things like ventilators, and, and the governor has said this. It's not just that when we exceed ventilators, we need a few more, and then we're good. It's that every day that number continues to increase, and it increases as an exponential function. That's why it's so critical that we do move off of that curve, because it's not just that we're going to, that's going to be a peak that we're going to ride at. It's that we're still going to see more and more people needing those resources. Yes, sir. Governor, I know you were saying earlier that it was um, a few weeks ago, I think, that it was up to local municipalities to enforce that curfew. Um, we have seen a number of parishes, including some in our UN area, where, uh, like Everville, they've started to implement a curfew. Would you recommend kind of that people get a curfew right now? Do you think that it would help with those numbers? Or what's kind of your stance on that? And also, do you think that we could possibly be extending that stay at home order for possibly another month? You know, um, first of all, we will cross the the decision threshold about expanding when we get there. We're, we're just not there yet. Uh, secondly, I, I can see where you would potentially have less social contact with a curfew, but that just assumes that, that people uh, wouldn't do during the daytime what they were going to do at night. Uh, if people are staying at home the way they're supposed to and only going out for essential uh, work, if they're going to and from work or going out for essential things like going to the grocery store and doing it once a week and so forth, the curfew wouldn't matter so much. Where the curfew, where the curfew I think, could help is in conserving resources at the local level with respect to law enforcement. So maybe you have an overwhelmed uh, law enforcement uh, agency uh, with a number of people in isolation or quarantine because of exposure or because of actual cases then they might would want to implement a cor uh, a curfew so that so that for certain time periods maybe 10 at night to 5 in the morning uh, they would need fewer law enforcement officers on the the streets because there would be less activity and then they can they can marshal a greater percentage of their available uh, deputies and so forth to work uh, during the non curfew period that's why in the very first uh, proclamation that i issued uh, we granted that authority uh, to the um, uh, chief law enforcement officers of the parishes, the sheriffs. And and you always have mayors and, and parish presidents who, who can issue those curfews as well. Leo? Uh, New York Mayor Blasio has called for a national draft of retired doctors and medical health care workers, that kind of thing. And he wants them rushed to New York. Have you all considered any kind of draft like that here? He's trying uh, to force them back into service. <clears throat> no, we, we haven't considered a draft, and I don't know how we would stand something like that up. But we have requested uh, through the State Board of Medical Examiners and through the Nursing Board uh, and through the hospitals uh, that retired doctors and nurses and other health care professionals who are able and still have current certifications, especially, uh, to come back uh, to work and, and to go back to work at the entities where they previously worked uh, and, and we are not just asking for people to come in uh, from Louisiana, but we're also reaching out to other states uh, where they might have some medical professionals where their uh, work isn't needed yet because they're not in the same place that we are uh, presently and asking those individuals come to Louisiana as well. And as much as I love New York, um, I'm, I'm not interested in having our uh, professionals drafted and sent to New York because we know we have real problems here in Louisiana in the not too distant future with respect to uh, our capacity to deliver health care and, and it is dependent on a number of things, beds, uh, ventilators and staff. And, and, and this really is one of the hardest things about standing up these, these standalone uh, medical monitoring hospitals like we're doing in the convention center. You still have to staff it. And so you got to be able to find the doctors and nurses. Uh, and very, very difficult uh, things to do. Melinda? In terms of the, the modeling, it, it, if there is a glimmer of hope that shows that um, 
it's flattening a little bit. Has that changed the projections for the exceeding of capacity in Region 1 for beds and ventilators? I know that that was kind of coming in the next week that we would exceed the number of ventilators that are available. Is that Has that pushed that back Well, any? Well, we, we announced over the last few days that, that we've had uh, some uh, reason to push those dates back already. Uh, I don't know that I'm prepared today and have been given information that says that, that it's different than I, than I announced yesterday. Um, and maybe you can talk to that. You know, every, every day we, we look at the data and we want to make sure that before we make a recommendation to the governor that we're seeing a, a solid trend. And so we're hoping that what we see continues. As I said earlier, I think that we're seeing some of that in areas across the state that are, that are actually making these move. And then as we feel that that's a credible enough move, we give that recommendation to the governor so that he can make the decisions with that evidence. I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously hospitals are talking right now about um, trying to see if two patients can use one ventilator, and they're obviously talking about uh, retrofitting other devices uh, to work in some way like a ventilator. Are we still on track to see hospitals needing to use those kind of tools in the next week? I don't know about the next week, but I think that we are. So we've also been aggressively pulling in anesthesia machines, uh, you know, looking at any anywhere we can get a ventilator, bringing as much of that to the front lines as possible. I do think, though, over the course of what's going to uh, be going on in the state, we would very much, you know, probably need to be using those things. And our ability to be successful in, in getting uh, future allocations of ventilators out of the strategic national stockpile will depend, at least in part, on our having done those things because we are having to justify our request with ventilators from that stockpile uh, with information about the actions we have taken to make maximum use of all these breathing machines and these anesthesia ventilators uh, to identify them, round them up, and get them to our Tier 1 hospitals, and we're doing that right now. And I do have a, a little bit of good news on the ventilator front. A uh, hundred uh, ventilators uh, did come in earlier today. They're en route to Region 1 hospitals as we speak. And those came not from the stockpile, but from um, a vendor of, of ventilators that, that we've been able uh, to, to get ventilators from. Uh, and that is, the I think, about 300 ventilators that we've sourced from this one vendor uh, over the last three weeks. And we're going to keep doing that every, everywhere that we can. And so, so when we do that, we, we, it, you know, we get, generate just a little bit more capacity. Uh, and then tomorrow... Uh, they will look not just at deaths and hospitalizations. They're also going to look at the, the new number of ventilators on hand, and that's why we keep inching back. But, but even when you're inching back in time uh, in terms of the date at which we're going to exceed our capacity, there does come a time in every single one of these models that we're seeing where we do exceed our capacity to deliver health care. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to make sure people understand. And the degree to which we exceed that capacity will depend upon our social distancing and whether we adhere to the mitigation measures. Uh, and, and we literally have it within our collective power uh, to decide whether more or fewer people will die from COVID-19. It, it is just that simple. Um, and I know people aren't accustomed to it, and look, it's hard for me to even say it, uh, but those are the facts of the matter. Yes, sir. What is our capacity? How many hospital beds do we have in Region 1? Well, oh, I, I didn't bring that information here with me today. and It changes, I mean, it, it changes every day. So I think, I think in aggregate, um, there's, there's something around maybe 4,000 4, that we're looking at in ICU beds, maybe 10,000 total beds. We can get that information for you, and it's, it's on our website. And actually, uh, it's on our dashboard now, available beds and, and available vents. It, and if but I again, these are daily admissions. I just want to make that clear. Right. We're talking about. If I'm understanding that correctly, is that we say we've got 2,000 today and 1,900 yesterday, and that's 3,900 that we're taught. In a two day period. In a two day period. So it accumulates. Yes. Yeah, and you have to be careful because you have to back out the NICU beds, for example, because they're not going to be suitable uh, for uh, the patients coming in. Uh, with, with COVID-19 either. Um, and, and I do want to point out, it's not just that we're surging now as it relates to ventilators and, and uh, our medical monitoring hospital, uh, which, by the way, I think is going to be open for you all tomorrow in New Orleans if you want to go down uh, to take a look at that, and I hope you will. Um, 
And so it's, we also have asked our, our hospitals to expand their capacity within their existing footprint. And they're doing everything that they can to stand up more ICU beds uh, in New Orleans with Oxner, in New Orleans with LCMC, um, here in Baton Rouge uh, with Our Lady of the Lake in Baton Rouge General, up in Shreveport. So we've, we've been taking advantage of the time that we've had in order to expand our ICU beds as well on existing footprint because that's the best setting to get this health care and that's the easiest place to staff uh, those additional beds but not easy uh, when you go out and do that standalone facility that's when it becomes really really difficult and that's also why those will be the less acute non-fragile patients who don't need to be on a ventilator they're not yet ready to go home but if we can take them out of the out of the tier one hospital sooner then that's a that's a bed that opens up sooner and more frequently than it otherwise would and you can service uh, more individuals who need to be in the hospital and receiving uh, that top line care at a tier one hospital. Yes, sir. As far as your conversations with the White House President, Vice President, obviously throughout this um, outbreak, there have been more focuses and priorities as we go in day to day. What right now in your conversations and your most recent conversations um, with the White House is the focus for you as far as federal assistance? Yeah. Or well, uh, it, it is the same thing I've been saying here for several days now. The biggest issue in the nearest term is ventilator capacity. Um, and, and so we keep making our case. We know that there remain um, several thousand ventilators in the strategic national stockpile. Uh, we're doing everything we can to put ourselves in position for an additional allocation and a timely allocation of those ventilators. Um, and, 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 of course, there's a lot of other things that we talk about. Uh, but I want to tell you and the people of Louisiana, these conversations that I'm having with the president and the vice president and with the head of FEMA uh, and so forth, they're not unlike all the conversations happening with the governors of every state. Uh, and, and we have New Jersey and New York out there and additional uh, places coming online with, with hotspots. And so we're all com competing for very limited resources which highlights what I've also been saying about the primary difference between managing this public health emergency response and managing the recovery from a natural disaster. In a time of a natural disaster, uh, you typically get the attention of sister states who send things that you need, and the federal government is focused squarely on Louisiana. Uh, that's just not able to happen right now. Uh, and so we're, we're doing the very best we can. And, and, and I appreciate all the, uh, the work that we've been able to do with our federal partners, and they have been responsive. Uh, am I frustrated because we don't have more? Yes, but am I mad at anybody? No, this is this just the way things are right now, and we're gonna continue to be as aggressive as we can to get the resources that we need and, and as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Have you heard anything else from the president about another COVID hospital or anything like that? No. No. Um, and I know the, the president uh, was talking about the assistance that he has sent to Louisiana with respect to, to the COVID hospitals. And so that assistance right now is, is through FEMA. Uh, we are setting up the convention center. Uh, we will have 1,000 beds ready by Sunday. We will have a second 1,000 beds uh, ready by uh, April the 20th. 500 of those beds are coming from the two field medical stations that he did approve. Uh, for us, and the, that's not staffed, but those are the beds, very, very helpful. And then we have a medical detachment coming uh, from the Navy, from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we don't know precisely the number of people. We have their advanced team in New Orleans now, about 50 people. We think at the end of the day, it's gonna be closer to 200 altogether. Uh, and we know that, that yesterday, uh, we were given clearance that they can, in fact, work at our personal housing unit, which is gonna have about 250 uh, patients who likely have COVID, but they don't have the positive test result back, but they ha they require uh, hospitalization. So those are the things that we've gotten from the federal government as it relates to uh, the the Morial Convention Center. Very very helpful, and and that's what the president was referring to. Awesome. Another question: I know your main priority is limiting COVID nineteen deaths, but how much do you think about the people as with your stay at home order? now extended through April, the potential, I know you're not ready to go there, potential it's another month after that. What do you say to those people who are now out of a job because of this and all the factors? Yeah. How much do you think about that? I know your focus is on COVID-19, but so many people are at home wondering, 
where my next paycheck's coming from. Well, first of all, we think about it a great deal. And uh, I get briefed on it every single day, the number of unemployment claims. Uh, I make sure that we waived, for example, uh, the, the period of time that you have to wait before you file your initial claim and when you get the benefit. I've waived this, the job search requirements that go with that. Uh, we're, we're working hard uh, to, to expedite taking those claims, getting those, those payments made. We're working with the federal government for the enhanced benefit of $600 a week that we will add to the, to the $247 state benefit. We're doing those things. Um, we are working with small businesses to make sure that they take advantage of the loans through the SBA uh, that can be forgivable to the extent that, that I spoke about them earlier. We stood up a loan guarantee program here in Louisiana uh, where the state is going to incur 20% uh, of the risk of those loans in order to spur our banks uh, to give small businesses uh, loans of up to $100,000, uh, where for three months there's no interest and there's no payments due, and the interest rate after that is 3.5%, which is less than what they're going to be able to get through the SBA. Uh, and we're leaning forward trying to do everything that we can to stand this economy uh, back up. Um, look, I, I just got a report about what our true February unemployment numbers were, and they dropped by 1.3% in Louisiana. We actually we, were on, we had the fourth fastest growing economy in the country uh, when this hit. We, we had an uh, unemployment rate uh, for seasonally unadjusted numbers that dropped to 4.3%, uh, I think it was. Uh, and so we were doing really, really well. We want to get back there uh, just as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and, but, but I will tell you, you're not going to restart the economy when you don't have the hospital capacity to render life-saving care to thousands of Louisianans, not just in New Orleans, but all over the state. And so we do have to get through this first, and we're going to be leaning forward, and we're consulting with people in the private sector uh, to, to figure out what we can do to best position us to, to move forward as quickly as possible. But these are very, very difficult uh, challenges, and, and, uh, and the question was, do I think about them? Yeah, I think about them, and I don't just think about them. We're working to make sure we're doing what we can now and that we're positioning ourselves to, to open the uh, economy back up and get people back to work and get businesses open again just as soon as we possibly can. But, but the virus, to a large degree, is going to determine when that is. I mean, that's just the fact of the matter. Uh, look, I want to thank you all again. Uh, we don't have another press briefing scheduled. I can assume that we will do one for sure on Monday, you are invited to go down to the Morial Convention Center tomorrow, uh, and I know there'll be more information forthcoming about that. If we have a need to brief you all either tomorrow or on Sunday, we certainly will, and we will we will put out that notice and give you all plenty of time uh, to get here. So again, I want to thank uh, those Louisianans who who are working us uh, hard to uh, comply with uh, the stay-at-home order and social distancing and all the mitigation measures. I want to strongly encourage those who are not to do better. Uh, and as always, I ask people to uh, lift one another up in prayer. Together, we're going to get through this. Uh, Louisianans are strong, uh, resilient people, and that's going to serve us well over the coming weeks um, and months. Uh, and we are going to get through this. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Uh, but it's going to still, it's still the, the case that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But we have the power to determine just how much worse it gets. That's what I need people to understand, and that's what I need uh, you members of the of the press to help with the messaging, because that remains the most important message for people to get all across Louisiana. Because there's actually hope in that. We're not consigned to some future that we have no control over. We can do something, and the sooner we do it, the better as you saw from, from the modeling. Thank you very much. Well, you were listening to Governor John Bell Edwards update us on mitigation efforts to flatten the curve of the coronavirus outbreak, starting today's briefing on a good note, saying Louisiana is second in the nation per capita and the number of tests done. Now, speaking of that, here are the latest numbers. 10,297 cases have been confirmed in the state. There have been 370 deaths and 1,700 people in the hospital, 535 of those on ventilators. Right now, 61 of 64 parishes have been affected, 
And Governor Edwards also mentioned during this news briefing uh, encouraging business owners to apply for the federal aid, saying you should immediately apply for SBA loans because there is a finite amount when it comes to social distancing. Governor Edwards says according to Louisiana social distancing report on anonymous cell phone data, Orleans Parish is actually doing great with an A. Jefferson Parish has a B grading, but he says other parishes are not scoring very well. Now coming up, President Trump will host a coronavirus task force briefing that will air on WUPL and Mayor Latoya Cantrell is also giving us a local update on the city's efforts to combat coronavirus that is expected to happen at 430. And when it does, we will bring it to you live on Eyewitness News. In the meantime, thanks so much for joining us and we'll send you back to regular programming. I hope we do learn that and I hope we now that we're fighting this common enemy I told you yesterday that we don't turn on each other once we do get this under control. So I love those I love that silver lining and thank you for being here all week. Dr. Coley, you ask you actually join us next week too. So if you have any questions about coronavirus and you want them answered by Dr. Coley, write into us on social media or you can also email info at dailyblastlive.com. Remember, no panic, just prevention and precaution. Thank you again, Doc. Could someone be stealing your identity or hacking into your phone or laptop? It can actually happen from across the room or from thousands of miles away. Or a company you trust with your personal information could be breached. Your information is in more places than ever. You need more protection than ever. That's why Norton and LifeLock are now part of one company, providing an all-in-one membership for your cyber safety. Norton 360 with LifeLock gives you identity theft protection, device security, a VPN for online privacy, and more. Cyber criminals keep looking for new ways to steal your personal information. You might not even know it until it's too late. Someone filed my taxes under my name. $6,000 was sent to some anonymous person, some anonymous bank account. They got into my bank account and my cell phone. What else do they have? With threats all around, you need 360 degree protection. Norton 360 with LifeLock gives you all-in-one protection against today's new threats. I've got two industry leaders coming together to help protect my identity and my devices. Why not have that added layer of protection so that you can sleep well at night? Join now and use promo code MYPROMO to save 25% off your first year. All Norton 360 with LifeLock memberships include LifeLock Identity Theft Protection backed by our Million Dollar Protection Package and U.S.-based restoration specialists who will work to fix problems. Award-winning Norton Device Security for multiple devices. A VPN for online privacy, securing your connections whether you're on public Wi-Fi or at home. And more. You never know where cyber threats are lurking these days. Don't wait to become a victim. Here's how to join. Norton 360 with LifeLock.